アーキテクトアイキャス。What's beauty? Well, that's easy, Randy. Beauty's in the eye of the beholder. That is true. Every individual has their own unique preferences when it comes to evaluating beauty. But there's more to it. There's a science to beauty as well. Let me give you all a quick example. If you line up a series of rectangles, you start at the left with a square, ratio of 1 to 1. The next one over has a ratio of 1 to 1.1. Next one, 1 to 1.2, all the way up to where you have a ratio of 1 to 2. You then show these rectangles to a thousand random people and ask them, which one do you find most visually pleasing, the most beautiful? The vast majority, like right around 60%, will say the ratio of 1 to 1.6 is the most visually pleasing, the most beautiful. Is there any significance to that ratio, 1 to 1.6? Oh, yeah, that's the golden ratio, or at least close enough for government work. It's the foundation of the golden section and the golden rectangle. You will consistently find the golden ratio in things that people find beautiful all throughout history, all throughout time, and all around the world. So beauty's just math, right? Ah, if it was only that simple. Let me give you all another example the Cathedral of Notre Dame in Los Angeles, the statue of the Virgin Mary over the entryway. When the statue was commissioned, there was a knockdown, drag out fight. The usual voices were screaming, You can't make the Virgin Mary look Northern European. That's Istin Phobe. But then the debate became, Who should the Virgin Mary look like? The congregation had East Asians, Southeast Asians, South Asians, African Americans, Latin Americans, Central Americans, Europeans. Somebody came up with the bright idea. We'll make the Virgin Mary look like all of them. The artist was more than happy to comply. The statue has the hairstyle of a Native American woman and has the facial features of every ethnicity you can imagine. Once you get past the politics, the PR, the hoopla, and the hype, the statue is considered to be an artistic failure. You do the math, the proportions and ratios of the features, they're good. Nothing wrong there, but the face is a muddy mess. It's missing something. Some undefined thing that changes fine into beautiful. There is a theory that beauty is based around the bizarre, the macabre, the grotesque. I disagree. I think the word that should be used is unique. In academia and Hollywood, there is an open hostility to the word unique. If you're a collectivist, you cannot allow any idea that gives legitimacy to the individual. And beauty is the personification of each individual's uniqueness. We know what's been going on in entertainment the last few years. Laura Croft, the beautiful, sexy explorer from the Tomb Raider games. In the live action adaptation, she was first played by Angelina Jolie. By all accounts, Angelina Jolie is a raving lunatic. But I don't think there's many people who would deny that at her peak, Angelina was probably one of the most beautiful women in the world. The modern reboot? Laura Croft doesn't look like a beautiful, sexy explorer. She looks like she belongs in a Korean boy band. Randy, you're just demanding that women cater to the male gaze. You want to go there? Okay, let's go there. That argument is 100% bullshit. A lot of people claim that the male gaze argument is meant to shame men. No. That's not the goal. They'll take it if they can get it, but that's not the real goal. The goal is to shame women. Beauty is aspirational. If men admire beauty, women should be ashamed to desire beauty. Male gaze argument conflates beauty with sexual desire. There is a relationship, but beauty is much more complicated than that. So far, I've talked about beauty as personal preference. Beauty is ratios and mathematics, and beauty is the uniqueness of each individual. There's one more key component that goes into determining whether we find another human being beautiful, whether we like them or not. Everybody has the ranking system. She's an eight, he's a seven, she's a 10. On average, I'm going to repeat that on average, a person's ranking can go up or down two points. 
based upon whether we like them or not. Hollywood from its beginning has known about this phenomenon. How many actors or actresses have had their careers killed in an instant because the public has learned that in their personal lives, they're first class pieces of garbage. They no longer like them, so they don't want to see them on the screen anymore. Every generation in Hollywood has had its it girl. And by it, they meant sex appeal. Sex sells, baby. But again, it's more complicated than that. Remember, we're looking at a potential four-point swing of how we perceive somebody's beauty, all based upon whether we like them or dislike them. Let's say, for argument's sake, that we want to promote, shall we call it, a non-traditional beauty standard. And we want to convince as many people as possible to accept that non-traditional beauty standard. How might you go about doing that? Try this on for size. I know it's going to be a radical idea, but just hear me out. Maybe the people that you're promoting who have this non-traditional beauty standard should be as likable as possible. You think? Let's go with a modern example of how not to sell a typical beauty to the public. Morphid Clark from Rings of Power. Morphid Clark knows how to glam up. I mean, she's an actress after all. She knows how to present herself in the best light. I think most people would agree Morphid Clark is a good looking lady. But like the modern Laura Croft, she has asexual leaning towards masculine facial features, as is the aesthetic that Hollywood has been pushing these days. Morphid Clark is going to portray Gladriel, one of the most beautiful women in all of literature. So how do the Rings of Power present her, introduce her to the public? That famous photo, her in armor, sword on back, legs spread, elbows on knees, holding a dagger, staring directly into the camera. You just don't like that picture because you're intimidated by a strong woman. No. If I'm in a public setting and I encounter another man sitting in a chair, leaning forward, legs spread, elbows on knees, hands protecting his core, holding something that could be a weapon, staring me down, I don't like that. I'm going to assume he's hostile to me. I'm going to watch him like a hawk, be in a heightened sense of awareness, fight or flight, prepared to react, whatever is necessary, at a moment's notice. I'm not going to like him very much. What I'm talking about is aggression. He's displaying aggression towards me. I'm feeling aggression towards him. Now, I'm not talking about theoretical here. I've experienced this situation. I know the potential consequences. Everybody repeat after me. If you're going to mess around with symbolism, you better know what you're doing. I know what the photographer or whoever came up with the concept of the photo we're trying to go for. I'm Galadriel, a badass. Take me serious. But what they created was an image that projects aggression. When you stare directly into the camera, and this is particularly true with still photography, the viewer interprets that stare to be directed directly at them. The viewer is going to interpret the symbolism, the message of the image, to be aimed directly at them. You have a picture of a person projecting aggression, staring directly at the viewer. Human nature, the viewer is going to feel aggression towards that individual. The image is sending confusing, contradictory, and downright uncomfortable messages. As a man, with my background and the way I was raised, I do not like having feelings of aggression towards a woman. I'm going to do everything in my power to avoid that woman in the future, which means I'm not going to like her very much. Guess what, folks? My personal subjective evaluation of Morphid Clark's beauty is a lot lower than my professional objective evaluation of Morphid Clark's beauty. I don't like her much. And it's all because of that photograph. And that was before I ever saw one frame of the Rings of Power. Whoever released that photograph screwed Morphid Clark because all it did was predispose a large percentage of the audience, men, to dislike Morphid Clark. The fact that the character was an inseparable cow in the show was just confirmation bias. Whenever I hear, you just don't like strong women, don't care. Whatever it takes to let you sleep at night. 
You can already see in the trailers for season two, they're trying to fix the damage, change the image of Morphid Clark. In season one, Morphid Clark was in armor, hair in a war braid, minimal makeup, sharp focus, harsh light. In the trailers for season two, Morphid Clark is trying to look a little more glamorous, more makeup, dresses, hair in complex fancy styles, soft focus, warm soft light. The damage has already been done. People don't like Morphid Clark, leastways how she's been presented in the Rings of Power. Changing her appearance, trying to make her look more beautiful, isn't going to make people think she's beautiful. Again, they don't like her. Once upon a time, many moons ago, Hollywood used to know how to sell atypical, non-traditional beauty to the public. I give you all Exhibit A, Katherine Hepburn. On paper, Katherine Hepburn's face shouldn't work. The ratios are all wrong. Her face is too long, too narrow, too many sharp angles, but yet it works. She has something. I don't know what it is, but she has it. Her face is appealing, beautiful. Now, when I say Katherine Hepburn's beautiful, I have to tell you all my bias. I like Katherine Hepburn. Why do I like her? Katherine Hepburn made a career out of playing likable, sympathetic characters. For the last few weeks, I've been yammering on about modern crap. Well, today, we get to talk about something good. Bringing up baby. I need to take a moment to back up, talk about the screwball comedy. In the 1930s, during the height of the Depression, Hollywood survived for two reasons. First, and the most important, they kept ticket prices low. The average person could afford to go to the movies on a regular basis. And two, the reason why people were willing to go to the movies on a regular basis? It was escapism. For a few hours, they could leave their troubles behind and just have a good time. I know, I know, it's hard to believe, but at one point in time, Despite all its problems, Hollywood was a net benefit to society. One of the most popular ways to have a good time? The screwball comedy. Now again, my bias, I like screwball comedies. I like the absurdity. For y'all who aren't familiar with the screwball comedy, you tell a story where you have one element that's completely outside of credulity, but you have everybody in the story treat that thing as normal, ordinary. And then chaos ensues around it. The screwball element in bringing up baby? Two people have to take care of a cheetah. In Connecticut, Cary Grant plays an academic who's very good at his job, but he's bumbling, absent-minded, socially awkward. Nope, doesn't ring a bell. Don't know anybody that fits that description. Katherine Hepburn plays a wealthy socialite who walks to the beat of her own drum. She's oblivious to the world you and I live in. Remember. Katherine Hepburn doesn't have traditional beauty. She has her own unique appeal. If she wants the audience to start rooting for her, hoping she gets together with Cary Grant, she has to get the audience to like her. Katherine has an added complication, though. Tall, slender body, elongated facial features. That's the aesthetic of European aristocracy, an aesthetic that was copied by Northeast Yankee old money. Katherine's accent reinforces the connection with Northeast Yankee old money. On top of that, the character Catherine plays in Bringing Up Baby is Northeastern Yankee old money. This was the 1930s. Large swaths of America blamed Northeast Yankee old money for causing the depression and then prolonging it, all for their own benefit. The audience is predisposed to not like Catherine or her character. In the very first scene where Cary Grant meets Katherine Hepburn on the golf course, she dismisses him out of hand, won't let him finish his sentence. You could interpret her to be a self-centered, narcissistic jerk who can't be bothered to deal with the peasants. In the next scene, Catherine's at a fancy restaurant dressed to the nines. She's sitting at the bar, and the bartender's teaching her to do a little trick with olives. Catherine and the bartender know each other. They're on a the first-name basis. They like each other, enjoy each other's company. She's genuinely interested in the little trick with olives. You start to realize Catherine wasn't being rude and dismissive to Cary Grant. This lady just walks to the beat of a different drum. Catherine is pursuing Cary Grant, desperately trying to get his attention. 
but she's so inept and incompetent in her efforts, everything backfires. As you get to know Catherine's personality, you realize she's sweet and kind, doesn't have a mean bone in her body. As she becomes more attached to Cary Grant, she becomes very loyal, willing to stand up and defend him, oftentimes with disastrous results. At the end, when she causes one last disaster, it's actually endearing. You all know the old adage, beauty skin deep, but ugliness goes to the bone? That's not true. Well, the ugliness going to the bone is true, but beauty goes to the bone as well. Bringing up baby is a classic example of this. Catherine Hepburn is so likable, so sweet. We raise our evaluation of her beauty. Randy, you think too much. Yes, yes I do. All of this just to say, Bringing Up Baby is a great movie. Well worth your time. At any rate, I hope I've given you all something to think about. And until next time, you all be safe. If you all are still here, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. While you're at it, why don't you like this video, subscribe to the channel, click that notification bell. You can hear me yammer on about something else next time. And while you're at it, feel free to share this video far and wide. Please like and subscribe. Please leave a comment.